Most of us are immediately intimidated at the idea of wealth management, let alone using the services of a family office. Wealth Creed is an African-owned, world-class family office that sees themselves as a reliable partner and advisor to affluent dynamic individuals, their families, as well as small businesses by applying sound and prudent investment and financial practices. My name is Jolly Mokorosi, and thank you for joining us on Wealth at Work, a show that focuses on wealth creation and education in South Africa. Today, we speak to Director and Wealth Manager at Wealth Creep, Palisa Dubek. Palisa has been active in the wealth management industry for more than 17 years, having spent time in both the banking and private wealth management arena. So welcome to Wealth at Work. Thank you. Thank you, Jolly. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So the first thing we always ask guests, and I think it's so apt, is what do you understand by wealth? What is your definition of wealth? What is wealth to you? Hmm. <laughs> I think for me, uh, wealth is freedom. Mm -hmm. It is freedom to spend your time the way you want to. It is the freedom to spend your time with the people that you want to. Um, I guess wealth is, it's more than a number. It's actually about what it can buy you. Because, you know, somebody would say, well, it's about money. How many zeros are there in your bank balance? I think it's more, more, um, it's, it's, it's about more than that. It's about the kind of life that it can afford you. It's about the kind of liberties, freedom um, that it can afford you. So, um, and I think that also allows one to define what wealth is for you um, because one might value time with family um, whereas another one values the opportunity to be traveling the world, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think the, differ, the definition of wealth differs for all of us, but for me, it's about the freedom that it brings one. And of course, the, the, those around you as well. Mm -hmm. I actually think it's the first time I've heard anyone talk about freedom, and yet it's so critical in, in kind of enjoying your wealth, because yeah. if you don't have freedom, then yeah. there isn't really the opportunity to enjoy your wealth. I mean, like, mm -hmm. is it worth it at all then? Yeah. And freedom comes in different ways. I mean, you, yeah. you, you could be hampered by your health, which means exactly. that you have limited freedoms, and you yeah. can't really enjoy your wealth. So yeah. it's a very interesting definition. I really, I absolutely like it. But you didn't, this wasn't something that came to you like yesterday or this morning when I sent the questions. This must have been something that came over time for you. How did you yeah. start this journey and how did you get to this point? Um, I guess you, you're right. Um, it's, it's what I've observed over time, um, interacting with clients. I mean, if you're asking, how did I get into this industry or want to do this? I, how, I did, you, yeah, how did you get in as well? <laughs> I stumbled into wealth management. <laughs> no, honestly, that's the truth. And in <laughs> fact, if you ask most um, wealth managers or financial advisors, most of us will give you that, that, that answer. Because when I was at school, this is not something, I mean, did you ever look up to a wealth manager? It wasn't something that was... There. We I had a wealth manager. <laughs> <laughs> didn't know what a wealth manager was until yeah. I started working. <laughs> yeah. So I really stumbled into it and it started at varsity. Um, mm -hmm. I was doing my second year um, of university after having completed uh, my first year in accounting, accounting studies. And I went back to the campus and I thought, you know what, I really don't feel this. You know, what else is there? And I went to the faculty office and I picked up a brochure and it said investment management. And I mm -hmm. turned the pages jolly and it spoke about stockbroking, shares, mm -hmm. you know, various stock, stock exchanges around the world. And I thought, this is what I want to do. <laughs> this sounds so much more interesting. But even then, um, I think that was the beginning of it. I still hadn't solidified exactly what I was going to do with this qualification. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. come, you know, third year, having 
my undergrad degree, then it was time to start um, applying for jobs. And I did what most graduates do, do. I applied to as many, you know, openings as I could find. I interviewed for international banks. I interviewed for banks in South Africa. And the first job that landed was a um, graduate program at a, at a bank um, in okay. South Africa. And you know what, the job market being what it was at the time, I just grabbed the opportunity. And um, yeah, that was the start of it. That was how I stumbled into it. And uh, I remember coming back, having now started in the graduate program, going back home with my laptop and files that they had given us. And um, you know, it, they had like insurance, this written on them, estate planning, this. And my father looked at me and he said to me, Palisa, so exactly what are you? Because I mean, what is a wealth manager? What is a financial planner? Do, do you mean to tell me that you are, should you die? <laughs> you know, because that's what brokers and, you know, financial <laughs> planners and what have you were known as in our community. And I must say that was the first statement that really irked me a little bit. I thought, my goodness, have I studied all these years to be a should you die? And so from that point in time, <laughs> from that point in time, I had to find proper meaning in what I was doing. Um, and to discover that there, there, there's a broader understanding science mm -hmm. towards what wealth mm -hmm. management mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And I quickly saw the, the difference that I could make in my community, in people's lives. And that's what really struck at my heart. And that's why I've stuck it out uh, all these years. I mean, you're not the only one that fires their financial advisor because there's just something that's missing, you know? And, and that something is important because some things you don't want to explain. You don't want to no. say to, a, to, a, to an advisor, well, you know what? Um, that line that you're seeing in my budget is actually money that I'm sending home to my aunt in the Eastern Cape, you know, and they mm -hmm. scratch their head. Why in the world would you want to do that? So you, you actually touched on a few things that I wanted to discuss today. Mm -hmm. One is you touched on financial planning and a lot yeah. of us are already intimidated by the idea of a financial planner, let alone a wealth management. So yeah. what is the difference between the two of them, first of all? What is a wealth manager? And then how does one make the leap between financial planning and wealth management? Because in my head, it's like mm -hmm. a spectrum. Yeah. Am I wrong? Correct me if I am. <laughs> yeah. Well, Charlie, you know, I wish I could tell you that there was a there's a standard, and unfortunately, mm. there isn't. Um, if you look at the private banks, for example, in South Africa, everybody has their own sort of uh, barometer, and it's really linked to their own profitability at the end of the day. Okay, it's about what size of client do we want to manage in this segment of the business. So mm -hmm. that's why you find that one bank's definition of a wealth management client may be different from another um, uh, institution's uh, definition. But I think if we go to the core of it, I mean, listen to what the word says, wealth management. So essentially, there, there already needs to be something there for us to, to manage. There needs to be a tangible problem, number one, for us to try and solve. That's essentially what mm. we do. We identify problems. Well, a client comes to us with aspirations and dreams, right? Um, yes. 
we, we, we articulate what the problems are and we find solutions around them. So to answer your question, what's the difference? I guess in wealth management, yes, there needs to be something there for us to already manage. And depending on which institution you go to, they'll have a different definition of what that is. Um, but I think as Wealth Creed, we've been very deliberate um, about, you know, straddling both lines. Because while it's, mm -hmm. it's convenient and comfortable and everybody wants to be wealth managing, um, we are deliberate about the fact that there, there also needs to be um, a certain amount of nurturing to get people yeah. there. So yes, as yes. much as we want to be looking after the bigger client with the bigger assets, we also understand, and our industry is also now appreciating that people actually need to pay attention to their financial planning a lot earlier than they currently do. Mm -hmm. And so to, be, to, to enable people to do that, our, um, our business models also need to accommodate that as well. And that's what we've tried to do um, at Wealth Creed. And I think the industry also as a whole has, has started to do that. So I wouldn't necessarily want people to be too concerned about where it is that I lie. Am I a financial planning client? Am I a wealth management client? The most important thing is for you to start. Pay attention mm. to your financial planning and wealth management, wherever you are um, on the spectrum. There certainly is an institution an advisor out there that can help you. The important thing is, uh, is about starting. Let's not be too caught up in the definitions. They're not that important. Mm, in the semantics of it, huh? Yeah. So I think the thing is you touched on, again, you touched on a couple of things that are interesting for me and, and it's the just start. So where mm. does one start if I want to, I mean, traditionally I've said, please contact the Financial Planning Institute, but that's not always the best way yeah. To find somebody who you think fits with you because that's the other thing that's important. Yeah. Um, between the two of us and the whole of the internet, I have fired <laughs> a few financial planners because yeah. I thought, nah, you don't yeah. actually get me. And I think that this was part of the brainchild behind this because I recognize the importance of these individuals, like individuals like yeah. yourself, wealth managers, financial planners, but I just wasn't finding the right fit. And I felt yeah. like some of the fit had to do with the color of my skin and some of my mm. aspirations. We don't have yeah. the same value systems yeah. and we, we have a different thing. So I really appreciate the fact that you have family offices run the mm. African way. And mm. I know that you have a passion about women. You see, that was very important to us. And I think that's, that was also part of the reason why you know, going the independent route and starting a, a wealth management firm like we did was important. Um, mm -hmm. And, and what, you're touch, what you're touching on, I mean, you're not the only one that fires their financial advisor because there's just something that's missing, <laughs> you know? And, and that something is important because some things you don't want to explain. You don't want to no. say to, a, to, a, to an advisor, well, you know what, um, that line that you're seeing in my budget is actually money that I'm sending home to my aunt in the Eastern Cape, you know, and they mm -hmm. scratch their head. Why in the world would you want to do that? So well, it's, it's my prerogative to spend money on my grandmother's funeral. And I don't want to explain yeah. this to you. Yes. But I'm prepared. Sorry, <laughs> I'm going to use a yeah. swear word. I'm prepared to go into debt to yeah. bury my grandmother properly. Yeah. And, and yeah. for some people, they yeah. can't fathom that it doesn't make sense. Yeah. yeah. And, and so for us, those were the nuances that we that we had to be very careful about and pay attention to. And that's what mm -hmm. we mean when we say the African way, because we really need to understand who it is that is sitting across the table from us and what's important to them. Mm -hmm. um, understand their, back, their background and what informs the decisions that they make. I mean, I'll make you a very simple example. Um, in South Africa now, having gone through, you know, well, still going through lockdown and, and COVID and all the havoc that it's wreaking um, on our economy and jobs and whatever, a lot of people have been retrenched. And you'll find that the very individual that's retrenched, the first thing that they think about when they get that package is how they want to fix their home or how they want to buy, a, you know, a property somewhere, whatever. Um, to if, if, if you approach this in a linear way and say, is this a good financial decision? 
Of course, the answer is going to be no, it's not very good timing. Wait until you have more security in, in your life before you can make those kinds of decisions. But if you understand that, you know what, I've never had a home or I grew up in a not so comfortable um, um, uh, upbringing. And so that's why having four walls that I can call my own is important to me. Those kinds mm -hmm. of nuances and understanding um, my are important. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's what we mean when we say the African way. But of course, um, I also think our, yeah, our training in the corporate world and in the banking space also equipped us for, um, you know, to be able to, to engage with anybody really. But it was about giving an outlet to that sector of the market that traditionally um, could not walk into a private bank and say, this is what I want. We don't want wealth management to be the preserve of the so and so's. Um, I believe that you know proper financial planning and wealth management can make such a difference to people's lives. And so that's why we need to make it um, accessible. And that's why that line or that, that ethos and way of thinking uh, and approaching wealth management is important to us. There was a very deliberate attempt to empower women and put women in positions where they could be, um, you know, economically self-sufficient. We're starting mm -hmm. to see the fruits of that now. If you look at the mm -hmm. stats of who's buying property. again on a couple of things that I actually just I wonder where we are, are so aligned in our vision um, is about the predominantly black South African woman and, yeah. and something that we've come to realize is that there are obstacles faced to the creation of wealth for black women in yeah. South Africa in particular from your experience what have you seen of this and, and what can you say about this you know um I think back to my own upbringing, I was mm. raised predominantly by women. Mm. You know, mm. while my parents were trying to forge their way and build their careers, I was raised by my grandmother, surrounded mm. by my aunts, you know? So I think females, um, we are really the backbone of economies, the backbone of societies. And we're starting to see I mean, you know, you, you look at the advent, the advent of um, democracy in South Africa and your BE scorecards and what have you, there was a very deliberate attempt to empower women and put women in positions where they could be, um, you know, economically self-sufficient. We're starting mm -hmm. to see the fruits of that now. If you look at the mm -hmm. stats of who's buying property, it's yes. women and it's single women. Yes. Okay? So that's telling you that we've actually now come full circle. And so um, the, the, the financial services industry now needs to start coming to the party and being in a position to cater for women. Mm -hmm. You know, they've done the basics. They've gotten their education. They've educated their children. Now their, their needs are evolving. And so as the financial services industry, we need to come to the, to the party as well. And that's why, yes, you're right. We do have a soft spot for, for women and particularly black women, because we believe that they are at a point where um, they need good sound financial planning so that this, this story that we've been building for so many years can, can, come, to, can, can come full circle. 
um, so that their legacies, their legacy stories can really be built, you know, and come to fruition. But I actually, <laughs> as, a, as a developmental like, uh, economist, I also believe that if we were to pay women yeah. properly, particularly yeah. black women, yeah. that from an economic developmental perspective, we would yeah. see a whole lot more progress. So that's yeah. one area in which things like paying people properly is so important. Yeah. But from your perspective, yeah. what's the link between advocacy for yourself and long-term wealth creation? For myself as an individual or as a black woman? As a black woman, as an individual, I mean, a lot of people think that it's not so important, so oh, it's overrated or mm. it's overdone, but there is an impact. Yeah, absolutely, I agree with you. And I think, you know, I, some of us that are a little bit, you know, that have started this journey a while ago, I mm -hmm. think we have the responsibility to be flying the flag and advocating for women's interests. Um, and, and that's a responsibility that I take also quite um, seriously being in the, in the industry that I do. We need to be speaking up on behalf of women and articulating what their needs are so that, you know, where in product development, for example, products are developed that meet their needs. So certainly advocacy for myself um, is important, but I'm, I also represent, uh, you know, uh, women um, that are not necessarily in my industry, but need the services that we, that we offer. So advocacy is certainly um, important and all of us can play a role in our little corners. All of us can play a role. Love, love what you're saying. But Vanessa, I really, um, I anticipate you being a guest over and over and over on this show that we're going to be doing incredible things in this space and talking about the topics that really kind of move the needle in terms of long-term wealth creation on the African continent. So once again, thank you so much. Absolutely a big, big, big thank you from Asset Wealth Network for joining us today on the show. And we will see you again soon. Thank you. I look forward to it, Jolly. I've enjoyed this very much. Thank you. Thank you for watching Wealth at Work. We look forward to sharing more stories and profiling other dynamic entrepreneurs and business people. Please like and share and leave a comment telling us what topics you'd like to see next. From me, Jolly Mokorosi, thank you and goodbye. Every African country you go to, children are told stories to, to learn principles about life um, because there, there are lessons that would otherwise be too harsh if it was not in the form of a folklore. Folklore is relatable across languages because there are people who listen to my podcast who do not understand Kosa all that well, but they were also raised on the same stories, on the same kind of folklore. Mm -hmm. When they hear, when they catch the thread, then it's like, aha, there's a, there's a light bulb that illuminates a concept which would otherwise be um, wrapped up in textbook or technicalese and, and be out of reach. And so to bridge that gap really, um, folklore, I guess, also came to me in my reflections as a, as a useful tool that is maybe underutilized today.